the potential of women in the free market as consumers, investors, donors and workers fuels the thinking of Professor Linda Scott. She's described protests against attempts to give women more power through their role in the economy as sheer irresponsible lunacy. Starting from her early study of consumer advertising and marketing, Scott explores how to harness the market to improve conditions for women, particularly in developing countries. I went to Oxford, where she's based, to ask her about how she conceived the idea of what she calls the double X economy and what market feminism means for women and the world. So Linda, where did your ideas first come from? Well, originally my first work career was in the advertising industry. Uh, and when I went back to get my PhD in communications, I wanted to focus on the social effects of advertising and I was particularly interested in the impact of visuals. What happened was, is about the time I got my first job, there was quite a lot of interest in the American media around the feminist critique of the impact of beauty advertising, particularly the images on women. So I got a lot of calls from journalists who expected me to mimic that critique. And in fact, it made absolutely no sense to me. It didn't square with anything I knew about how humans process visuals, and it didn't square with anything I knew about how humans choose what goods they buy. Uh, so I went into um, a long period of research where I tried to figure out what the source of this critique was, what had driven it. And as part of that research, it took me 10 years, but eventually what emerged from that was the story of women's involvement with the birth and rise of the modern economy in America. And so it was from there that I developed these other ideas. So this idea that has sort of stuck around that uh, the market economy sort of exploits women, particularly through those images or through forcing them to buy things and so on, is there any truth at all in that? Um, very little, I would ha it would be my honest opinion. Uh, at the time I started researching this, um, I did do a complete inventory of what was available, what was really known in terms of good scholarship at the time. And you have to understand that women's history was a very new thing, and so there was only a little bit of it done, and it focused on a very narrow slice of women's culture. And the rest of it, the story had not been told. And the critics were basically spinning collectively a a fabricated history of what had happened. Um, and I, I think that instead, the story of the involvement of women in the modern economy is an, it's really an epic of transformation. It's a very important story. And it happens along the same time and in the same path with the rise of the women's movement. And so essentially what happened was that these two things not only went along in parallel paths, but they substantially enabled each other. Neither would have happened without the other, kind of. So I think it's really quite the opposite. And I think the preponderance of evidence is, is on my theory. So you, you developed this into the idea of a double X economy and market feminism. Explain to us a little bit what that is and how it is important. When I, when I uncovered this narrative, what I discovered was that there was this whole sort of self-contained almost economy of women that was in fact focused in fashion and beauty. That was the point of entry. And it occurred at every level from the media to the retailer to the seamstresses to the women who made the cosmetics, right? And in order to understand how it worked, you had to understand it as a total system. And given the way I felt it had turned out for women, when I came to Oxford, I wanted to see whether or not the things that had happened in the modern economy in America could be replicated today in developing countries to the benefit of those women there. And if so, you would take certain practical interventions that replicated successful things in the past, and that would be a kind of market feminism. A feminism based on the market economy as opposed to legal rights, um, though obviously you need legal rights as well. Now, I know you've written that, that revolution generally is not good for women. It tends to uh, leave them out eventually. Yeah. Um, but what you're talking about is a gradual revolution, isn't it? Absolutely it is, and that's part of what I mean when I say that the, the, the history in America is one of an epic transformation. It is it is dramatic, it is a really important story. And if you were trying to replicate that, it would indeed be a revolutionary thing. And that is exactly what is going on right now. It's a very big deal. 
but it has to occur gradually because of the essence of this particular form of subordination. It's, it's, it's too easy for the beneficiaries of your intervention to be hurt because the backlash tends to be violent against them. So what sorts of things are we talking about? What are these practical interventions that, that could affect change for women in developing countries particularly? Yes, um, well, for example, um, there's a quite a big effort afoot right now to try to integrate more women-owned businesses into the global supply chain. Um, and um, so there are people who are looking at uh, how to help them, uh, for example, scale up so that they can uh, supply major retailers, uh, how they can smooth out their um, production schedules to interface with the seasonality of the global supply chain. Um, how to get them access to capital is always a big problem. It's quite a big undertaking and you, once again, you have to look at every point of contact with the economy in order for it to work. But they're all about practical interventions and some of the most important institutions in the world are engaged in this. So it, it is really an important moment. And some of these institutions obviously are the multinational companies that are considered by opponents of, of free market capitalism to be uh, essentially the baddies. Uh, yeah. How does an alliance with those types of companies help women in these countries? Well, it's an interesting phenomenon because in the first place you have to look at the limits that are already evident in state sort of interventions and uh, there's only so much you can do through legislation. There's only so much you that a culture is willing to tolerate in, tor in terms of enforcement of rights. Um, with an economic path for example, if you go into a, into a developing country with a major multinational at your back, right, you have a different kind of credibility and a different set of tools. And at least in my experience, nearly always with these major multinationals, the person who is actually in charge of the women's empowerment program or any of these practical interventions, it's usually somebody female, it's usually somebody young, very often a mother of small children. And the way she looks at it is, I have been given this opportunity by my employer to do something good on behalf of women and they take that opportunity and they run like crazy with it. So it, it kind of has to be understood almost on a, on a personal level. It is also true, however, that the major corporations need for the women's economy to build up to, to a certain degree because women are the consumers in the world and they need the women to have a little money and the freedom to spend it. Do you meet opposition in your attempts to ally what is essentially a business case from multinational corporations with the principal case for women's advancement that you're making? Actually, not very often. Uh, and that's only because at this point, uh, the data are overwhelmingly on the side of needing for the world economy to empower women. Um, we have Seemingly, seemingly endless statistical information to show us that in order to uh, maintain growth we're going to have to include women better. Uh, in order to get rid of some of the, the real scourges of the developing world such as ongoing hostility, instability, slavery, we really need to do better for the women. So it's, it's really a very compelling case and I don't honestly find very many people who are informed, um, which usually the leaders of the multinational companies are very informed, they don't, they don't often argue with it. Tell me about a couple of examples of things that you've done on the ground that are actually demonstrating the effect of this type of intervention. Okay, um, let me, um, I'll tell you about one that in fact would be for most people very controversial. Um, I've been studying um, a, a system in rural Bangladesh uh, since 2008. It was initiated as a poverty alleviation program and it's a rural distribution system that was built point by point by a team of young men who wanted to empower the very, very poor women. And so they recruited these women and trained them up and they uh, put together a kind of a consortium of local and international businesses to provide them products to sell. And this system has turned out to be really robust, um, partly because of the very careful mix of products that are in that basket. Um, and eventually what has come out is, is that it can provide the women with a sustainable income, it provides the companies with a mode of distribution that's very important since most of the population in Bangladesh is still rural. And it also provides uh, an income uh, even for care. Uh, so it's actually a very, very um, successful system. I mean, poverty alleviation doesn't sound super controversial. What's 
where, where are the objections to this? The objections are all around the impact or the supposed impact of the consumer goods that are going through the system. Uh, people in the West have forgotten how important some of these goods were a hundred years ago. Easily accessible and affordable soap, for example, toothpaste, for example, are, are part of what goes through this system. And so they want to say things like, well, oh, you're just making the poor buy things they don't need. Well, in fact, it's probably to their benefit, some of these products. Overwhelmingly, what the, most of the products in this system are some form of soap. And most illnesses in, in remote areas is because of lack of clean water and soap, right? But in addition, there are things like um, cosmetics, uh, phone time, batteries, uh, and people don't really fully appreciate what some of those products can mean uh, in an environment like this, and so they just dismiss it and think it's corrupt. Right. So overall, some of the things that you're suggesting sound as though they are a way of sort of rehabilitating capitalism um, in the developing world in particular. Is this a, an indication, is what you've found an indication that this is the free market capitalist system is actually the, the best system that we've, that we've got? I think it is the best system from a woman's point of view, the best system that has been devised so far. The global data show that pretty clearly. Uh, I don't think it's perfect and I think once, one of the ways in which it is imperfect and one of the things that contributed to the, to the crash is that it, it is in some ways very exclusive. And I think that this is yet one more piece of evidence that says we need to have a more inclusive economy and if we have a more inclusive economy it will be more stable. But um, yes, I do. I think it is, it, is, it is offering a real moment of hope. Linda Scott, thank you very much. Thank you.